to social issues including domestic violence and abuse. In 2022, WIN will be expanded, targeting even more women and offering additional and advanced courses in several areas. Turning, sir, to persons with disabilities. Our government here again is concerned about the well-being of persons living with disabilities. And we are making a conscious effort to bring social services to all eligible persons. In this regard, the National Commission on Disability commenced a survey to record all persons living with disability. In 2021, persons living with disabilities received training, psychosocial support, and the public assistance. In 2022, our government will be collaborating with the Ptolemy Reed Rehabilitation Center to develop a national classroom for autistic children. In addition, the civil works will continue on the Center for Disability and the construction of a new care center at the Mahaika Hospital for children living with disabilities will commence. Additionally, two wheelchair buses will be purchased to aid in the transport of residents from the Mahaika Hospital and training complex. Mr. Speaker, to ensure that persons with disabilities achieve their full potential, we must begin care and support from early childhood. Currently, there are approximately 500 children enrolled in our special education needs schools, and we will continue conducting assessments to identify other children through the education system who might need special education needs services. Our government will continue to, to work to destigmatize special education needs and encourage our parents and children to access these services. Further, we have worked to improve pedagogy in the area of special education needs. And to this end, over 2,200 teachers have been trained to provide appropriate instruction. Additionally, over 100 teachers are enrolled in higher education training via the GOAL program. Their upskilling will surely serve to improve the learning outcomes of our, of our SEN special, special ed program to the benefit of our children. Victims of domestic violence. Mr. Speaker, abuse of any form is unacceptable within our society and is a social issue that cannot be ignored. Our government continues to pursue initiatives to, present, to prevent domestic violence. In this regard, the Inter-Ministry Gender Focal Point Committee was reconstituted, as I mentioned earlier. In addition, domestic violence training is now part of the curriculum of the police training college. And the Guyana police force has established domestic violence units and special rooms at identified police stations to receive reports in more suitable environments. Mr. Speaker, in 2022, an amount of 19.7 million is earmarked for the rehabilitation and extension of domestic violence shelters at WIM and on the Neeming, which will continue to provide services for victims of sexual and domestic violence. Support to victims now also includes expanded legal aid services, for which an amount of $114.9 million has been allocated. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to Amerindian and hinterland development. In pursuit of our government's commitment to ensure that all the people of Guyana participate fully in the economic transformation that is currently unfolding in our country, we are mindful of the unique challenges faced by our Amerindian brothers and sisters, particularly those residing in remote communities. We're committed to ensuring 
The Cameroonian and hinterland villages are economically empowered, first and foremost through the land titling program, which languished over the last five years, or over the five years from 2015 to 2020, rather. And secondly, through development of the Amerindian village community. We are also committed to ensuring that all of the country's best educational and training opportunities are as available to our hinterland brothers and sisters as they are to those on the coast. And we are committed to ensuring that the quality of social services delivered to all villages is improved markedly. Mr. Speaker, in 2021, a total of five demarcations were completed. The certificates of title for these demarcations are currently being issued. And our Amerindian brothers and sisters who reside within Kapui village would have been the first of these five villages to receive their certificate of title. In 2022, our government will continue, the right, continue to support the rights of our indigenous peoples by accelerating the land titling program at a cost of $561.6 million allocated in this budget to achieve a target of 20 certificates of title. Mr. Speaker, in supporting sustainable livelihoods of hinterland communities, in 2021, this government expended $673 million for tractors, implements, and economic projects aimed at enhancing the development of agriculture, tourism, women, and youth. This, this saw 112 tractors and trailers along with implements distributed to Amerindian communities to help promote village agriculture as well as to use for use in transport. Mr. Speaker, in 2022, a further sum of $411.2 million will result in 71 additional communities benefiting similarly, bringing, similarly bringing the total number of communities to 183 since this government took office. Additionally, and importantly, sir, as mentioned earlier, to improve connectivity, a sum of $3.4 billion is budgeted for the Hinterland Roads Program. The speaker, in 2021, $666.5 million, million was expended on stipends to engage 2,000 community service organizations. It would be recalled, sir, that these, these 2,000 CSOs were summarily term terminated during the 2015, immediately upon the APNU AFC assuming office in 2015, sent home. We committed then that immediately on returning to office, we will resume this program and bring once again 2,000 young Amerindian persons, young 2,000 young Amerindian Guyanese persons back into the workforce. And we did it. We delivered on that commitment. We also trained the CSOs. A further sum of $115.6 million was spent towards training of 420 CSOs in areas such as ICT, licensing and main tractor driving, licensing, maintenance, solar panel installation and maintenance, equipping them with skills that are relevant and that would be of value both to their own personal upliftment but also of value within the village economy. Sir, in 2022, I'm pleased to announce that the number of CSOs will be increased 
to 2,500. Creating an additional, creating an additional 500 jobs for young, young Amerindian persons. And the sum of 60 million will be spent on training 660 of these CSOs to serve in these 220 communities in a variety of areas, tourism and hospitality, development of business plans, food safety prerequisites, good manufacturing practices, and the list goes on. Mr. Speaker, needless to say, along with other countries countrywide, 31,295 hinterland students are expected to benefit this year from the Because We Care cash grant, which we resume. Additionally, to improve access to education and skills, a sum of $93.3 million is budgeted towards the Hinterland Scholarship Program, where 805 students are expected to benefit. Mr. Speaker, in total, $3.1 billion is allocated for core Amerindian development programs. This, along with key investments across every sector, will set the stage for rapid improvement in well-being in our Amerindian and hinterland villages. I turn now, sir, to improved governance and institutional reforms. Governance. Mr. Speaker, the governance architecture of this government and the commitment and conviction of this government are based firmly on inclusivity, participation, transparency and accountability, and the rule of law. It is grounded in the concept and policy thrust of one Guyana. The consultations on the new and expanded LCDS 2030 is but an example of op the operationalizing of this one Guyana adopting an inclusive approach to decision making. A major development that will occur in 2022, sir, will be the establishment and operationalizing of the One Guyana Commission. It would be recalled, sir, that His Excellency the President, at his inaugural address at the opening of this National Assembly last February, I believe it was, spoke of the intention to bring a law to introduce the One Guyana Commission with specified objectives to be headed by, the on, by no less a person than the Honorable Prime Minister. It is our intention, sir, to establish that one Guyana Commission and to start its extremely important work in pursuit of its extremely important mission. It is our intention to have that work start in 2022. Mr. Speaker, all of these guide our government's approach to everything. The anti-corruption framework of Guyana is based on commitments to our treaty obligations made to the Inter-American Convention Against Corruption and the UN Convention Against Corruption. Our challenges are, of course, like many other small developing countries. They are related to factors of human, financial, and technical resources. For this reason, sir, capacity building will be prioritized to strengthen the implementation of our, our anti-corruption program and policies. Furthermore, progress has been made in relation to the reconstituting of key governance institutions, the Ethnic Relations Commission, the Police Service Commission, the Public Procurement Commission. Mr. Speaker, we hope that by the end of the budget process, that we will get back to normal parliamentary meetings and sittings and that these items on the agenda will move through quickly so that these important constitutional bodies can be in place as required by the supreme law of our land.
Mr. Speaker, we have heard, we hear from time to time much about exclusion and discrimination by many on the other side of the House. However, this government's track record of ensuring a wide consultative process is one of our strong points, unlike our friends on the opposite side of the House. We remain committed to inclusion and participation of our citizens in the areas of government policy and legislative reform. Inclusive governance is also demonstrated by the fact that our programs are accessible to all. For example, our COVID-19 relief program, our support cash grant program, our gold scholarships, our youth programs, our housing drives, among many others. These demonstrate to the people our commitment to make sure that those who need help are not blocked nor stymied in accessing government programs. We will continue with public education and engagement initiatives to improve stakeholder awareness, inclusion, and participation. The philosophical framework of this government is that good governance is critical to ensuring equity in the development process. And so, nowhere is this expressed more elegantly, more elegantly and indeed eloquently than by His Excellency the President when he said that we must strive and ensure that we avoid becoming a rich country of poor people. It is for that reason, sir, that I, st that I began my presentation by saying we are committed to national unity and national prosperity. Turning, sir, to justice sector reform. Mr. Speaker, the government recognizes that the stability and strength of the justice sector are paramount to public trust and to investor confidence. We have always supported and will continue to support the implementation of reforms in order to enhance and modernize our judicial system, while at the same time maintaining the highest respect for their constitutional independence. Our government has allocated $4.7 billion in 2022 to build on the important work and advancement of the justice sector in Guyana. In 2021, we expended $879 million on the completion and construction of courts and living quarters countrywide, which will result in Bartika and Madhya becoming operational this year. In 2022, $1.3 billion will be expended to support the judiciary to improve access to justice, especially in previously underserved areas. To this end, Port Kaituma, Mabaruma, and vigilance magistrate's courts will be completed in 2022. While two additional magistrate's courts and living quarters along the East Bank of Demerara in Timeri and Friendship will be advanced. These investments will increase the delivery, the number of courts across the country to 46, from 41 in 2019, and will result in more timely delivery and improved access to the justice system and, of course, reduced costs to citizens and improved convenience. Mr. Speaker, a further $250 million has been allocated to improve the other aspects of the criminal justice system. To this end, the University of Guyana's prosecutorial program will commence this year, catering for 25 students initially for a duration of 13 weeks which will increase, increase our number of trained prosecutors. Further judicial policies aimed at reducing over-reliance on imprisonment are being developed to increase the use of alternative sentencing in the justice system. To complement these initiatives, a management information system for the Ministry of Legal Affairs, Restorative Justice, Ministry of Human Services, the Probation Department, the Guyana Police Force and the Director of Public Prosecutions will become operational this year, ensuring a coordinated approach to the effective management of cases.
Mr. Speaker, I turn now to public safety and security. Our law enforcement agencies will continue to work to preserve public trust and uphold the rule of law. Initiatives such as strengthening community engagements and partnerships, increasing and improving the deployment of resources in all police regional districts, enhancing leadership, professional de development, heightened crime fighting capabilities, are all elements, critical elements of our strategy. Concomitantly, technology will be, concomitantly, sir, technology will be developed and applied to buttress intelligence gathering and information sharing to improve diagnostic competencies by law enforcement agencies. To support these initiatives, a sum of $47.9 billion has been allocated in 2022 towards ensuring the restoration and preservation of law and order at all levels of our society. In 2022, $4.9 billion has been allocated to strengthen the assets of the force. In this regard, work will commence on a multi-story building to consolidate the operations of the Brickdam Police Station, which was gutted by fire in October 2021, and for which over 400, I'm advised arson, and for which $400 million is allocated. Additionally, the role of ICT in our security and crime fighting capabilities cannot be overemphasized. In this regard, $2.5 billion has been allocated to expand the Safe City program beyond the boundaries of Georgetown. This program will see the entire country being connected to CCTV cameras, monitored centrally, as well as at the regional command centers to be established across the country. Moreover, sir, satellite phones and body cameras will be acquired to boost operational efficiency across all regional divisions. Mr. Speaker, to support the, the efforts of the Ghana Police Force, in 2021, we promised to resuscitate community policing groups nationally. At the end of 2021, 176 of those groups were active. We're targeting to resuscitate another 175 in 2022. To this end, we have allocated $99 million to support these groups who have proven to be extremely effective across many rural and hinterland communities. Mr. Speaker, training is also a key strategic imperative of the Guyana Police Force. To this end, a sum of $120 million is budgeted in 2022 towards the training of ranks, while other ranks will be added to ensure greater coverage across communities. Training in the areas of crime and traffic management will continue to be facilitated both locally and in partnership with international institutions. In the prison service, transforming the penal institution into a correctional facility that reforms the mindsets of, in, of inmates to benefit all of society post-incarceration is a core objective. During 2021, over $2 billion was expended mainly to complete the first block of the Masruni prison and to commence construction of three prison blocks at Luziknan. In 2022, a further $2.3 billion is budgeted towards enhancing prison infrastructure, 
Works will continue on the Lusignan prison, which will be transformed into a modern facility to house both, which will be transformed into a modern facility to house both male and female prisoners, including a vocational school, an infirmary annex, prison headquarters, and command center. Additionally, works will be conducted at Maseruni prison on a second prison block. We will also invest in the training of 1,400 inmates in such areas as anger management, literacy and numeracy, tailoring, amongst others, at a budgeted sum of $88.9 million. In the fire service, sir, in 2021, the operational capabilities of the fire service were severely challenged. Our government reviewed the situation and took concerted action to identify interventions to arrest this challenge. In 2021, over $150 million was allocated for installation of 139 new fire hydrants in housing areas and for repairs to 51 fire hydrants. I'm pleased, sir, to announce that budget 2022 provides an additional $100 million for additional installation in order to ensure adequate water supply in the event of a fire. To augment the capability of the fire service, especially at a time when our landscape is changing towards modern high-rise buildings, $255 million will be invested to procure a hydraulic platform to bolster our firefighting capabilities. Additionally, water bowsers, ambulances, and an all-terrain firefighting vehicle will all be procured in 2022. Mr. Speaker, turning to local government. The local democratic organs have a legacy of weak institutional and technical capacity and poor accountability. Despite this, our government remains firmly of the view that these organs have an important role to play in local governance and in local service delivery. We remain committed to supporting these organs in building capacity to perform their constitutional roles. We aim to further strengthen the institutional and human resource capacity of the LDOs to ensure accountability and better management of resources. Improve sanitary and environmental conditions and help promote infrastructural development at the local level. In 2022, Mr. Speaker, an amount of $714 million has been allocated to finance grants to the local democratic organs to help maintain infrastructure and improve services. Additionally, work will continue on the Parika and Monrepo markets to provide a safe, secure, and conducive environment for vendors and customers, as well as on the iconic Georgetown City Hall at a cost of $666.8 million. Mr. Speaker, furthermore, Mr. Speaker, furthermore, a scaled up, a scaled up community infrastructure my apologies, sir. Mr. Speaker, furthermore, a scaled up community infrastructure improvement project will be launched in 2022 at a cost of $5 billion to improve the sanitary and environmental conditions, as well as to improve community aesthetics within the jurisdiction, the areas within these LDOs, these local democratic organs, within villages. Mr. Speaker, turning now to public, public administration and public financial management, matters related to revenue management. Mr. Speaker, to promote voluntary compliance, the Guyana Revenue Authority is currently revolutionizing its business processes, utilizing ICT and public awareness in our goal to create a modern and efficient tax administration agency. 
Key activities will include implementation of phase two of the revenue management software optimal in 2022, along with other activities to promote voluntary compliance. These will include adoption of the harmonized system, the HS 2022, which will replace HS 2017, to update the customs laws and regulations and to bring us into harmony with regional and international uh, classification systems, efforts to implement digitized versions of certificates of origin will also be explored, full implementation of the single window automated system to which I alluded earlier to create a more business friendly environment reduce bureaucracy and red tape and improve the ease of doing business are all initiatives that will be pursued. Mr. Speaker, indeed, in addition, in addition to these initiatives, strong emphasis will be placed on building institutional capacity, in particular to effectively discharge and execute the authority's new responsibilities in the oil and gas sector, as well as in the new and emerging sectors in the changing structure of the Guyanese economy. To this end, sir, to meet the cost of it investing in its capabilities and to finance the cost of its operations, a sum of $8.9 billion is allocated to the Guyana Revenue Authority. Mr. Speaker, in 2021, turning to payment systems, Mr. Speaker, given our government's commitment to mobilize digital solutions as far as possible in all government services, we made in 2021 significant progress in modernizing Guyana's payment system infrastructure. The real-time gross settlement system, the central security, securities depository systems were fully integrated with the automated clearing house. The new system went live during the first quarter and has already facilitated over 413,000 transactions to date, including, sir, I'm pleased to report, the payment of all government salaries and pensions, except for persons living in remote hinterland communities. In 2022, we will engage our financial systems providers to further integrate our systems in central government with the national payment system. This will enhance the processing of all payments electronically, thus reducing the printing and handling of checks. When fully operationalized, all government payments, as well as business to business payments through the banking system, will be instantaneous and the security of financial transa transactions will be substantially improved. Turning, sir, to the National Insurance Scheme, Mr. Speaker, the National Insurance Scheme is an extremely important national institution which has served Guyana well, but which is in need of serious reform, both from the administrative and policy standpoints. Administratively, the scheme has a long-standing reputation for, for inefficiency and is a major source of frustration to its contributors and pensioners alike. This government, immediately upon assuming office, committed to confront this problem. We appointed a new board of directors at the end of 2020 and mandated that board to address the long-standing administrative problems, and much has been achieved since. The scheme has rolled out innovative and easy-to-use technology-based solutions, such as its WhatsApp-based online call-in function, which is extremely popular, particularly amongst overseas-based pensioners, which allows online submission of life certificates and other transactions. Mr. Speaker, we also conducted a series of outreaches throughout the country, listening to and addressing public concerns. 10 such outreaches were conducted and 1,606 persons seen. The outreaches were proved to be extremely effective in addressing public complaints, and almost 75% of the matters raised have since been resolved. At the same time, sir, 
It is well known that the scheme faces serious challenges regarding its long-term viability. Its last actuary evaluation was done in 2016 and indicated the deficiency of the fund. Preliminary work has already begun to analyze the various recommendations made on the scheme over the years with a view to identifying and implementing lasting and sustainable reforms to the institution. Turning, sir, to public procurement. Last year, sir, I conveyed our government's commitment to restoring a public procurement system that had been systematically dismantled by the AP and UAFC when they were in government. Since we resumed office, our government has worked tirelessly to restore credibility, confidence, accountability, and transparency in public accountability, in public, in public, transfer, in public procurement, my apologies. Since assuming office, we have worked tirelessly to restore credibility, confidence, accountability, and transparency in public procurement. To this end, we have remodeled, modernized, and created a more user-friendly NPTAB website. We have uploaded the records of all tender openings and all contracts awarded at the NPTAB level. We have instituted a public virtual tender opening process twice weekly, whereby bidders are provided visual, voice, and text communication at the opening process from the comfort of their homes. We've issued revised, updated, new standard bidding documents for goods, works, and services, including security services. We have completed the design and development of the bidder's register, and we're planning to roll it out, roll this out in, 2020, in the first quarter of 2022. We have compiled a comprehensive training manual for procuring entities, including ministerial and regional boards, and the list, sir, goes on. Going forward in 2022, we intend to continue to adhere to the stri strictest of principles of transparency and good governance in public procurement, and to build on all of the gains that we have already made and to which I have just alluded. We will also focus heavily on capacity building and training, not just within NPTAB, but within ministries and amongst ministerial and regional tenders board. We will also operationalize in 2022, the bidders register on which I, as I mentioned earlier, on which work to develop is considerably advanced. Finally, sir, action has been taken with a view to seeking parliamentary approval for the appointment of the members of the Public Procurement Commission. Mr. Speaker, in relation to data systems strengthening, statistical systems and strengthening of our statistical systems, our government recognizes the immense value, immeasurable value indeed, of, and the importance of quality, timely and reliable data to inform and drive policy and decision making at all levels. In 2022, we will continue to strengthen the Bureau of Statistics and the National Statistical System to improve cooperation, coordination, and streamlining of data capture, sharing, processing, analysis, and reporting across the various statistical offices of government. Mr. Speaker, 2022 is a significant year for statistics in Guyana and the Caribbean as it marks the conduct of the 2020 round of the Population and Housing Census. Census 2022 will establish baseline data sets that will inform and guide policy at all levels. And for the first time, the National Census will use geographic information systems to improve mapping. The resultant census data would strengthen evidence-based development planning and support policies and programs in all areas, as well as the monitoring and updating of the SDGs. Turning, sir, now to foreign relations and the diaspora. Mr. Speaker, the government's main foreign policy objectives continue to be the preservation of Guyana's sovereignty and territorial integrity, advancing bilateral relations, and conducting economic diplomacy through the promotion of trade and investments, 
projecting a positive image of Guyana through sensitization and awareness of policies and programs being undertaken by government, maintaining a proactive role in international affairs, and harnessing in a structured manner the skills, expertise, and other resources of the Guyanese diaspora who can con contribute so immensely to our country's development. Mr. Speaker, in 2022, our government will continue to pursue a robust foreign policy guided by the main thrust of our domestic agenda. The preservation of our sovereignty and territorial integrity will remain paramount. In this regard, of particular focus will be the completion of the memorial on the merits of our case in the controversy with Venezuela, which, by order of the International Court of Justice, must be submitted to the court by March 8, 2022. Mr. Speaker, we will also focus on deepening relations with member states of the Caribbean community, continuing to give priority to expanding trade, maintaining our commitments to CARICOM, and accessing new markets, ensuring that external trade negotiations redound to the benefit of the country and the people. We will also continue to engage both traditional partners and also seek to foster the development of new strategic alliances. In this regard, our diplomatic mission will be open in the United Arab Emirates during this year, and we will also be taking advantage of the CARICOM diplomatic mission in Kenya to have representation in that office. Turning to the diaspora, sir. Mr. Speaker, the contribution which our diaspora can make to national development is not to be underestimated, especially at this point in our country's economic history. In concretizing our, dias our diaspora strategy, we will be implementing initiatives that would facilitate better coordination Ensuring the, involvement, that the, in, ensuring the involvement of individuals and associations from the diaspora cater to specific needs and areas that would meet our development goals and also benefit all stakeholders. Mr. Speaker, in 2021, the first virtual diaspora conference was successfully hosted with over 500 persons from 77 countries in attendance. Subsequent to this, a strong foundation was laid in Guyana to allow for greater ease and facilitation of diaspora initiatives. Recognizing the value the diaspora brings to our development efforts, amongst the plethora of strategies and plans to be implemented in 2022, are the development of the diaspora database, including the expert database, and the launching of the diaspora website, which will not only become a platform to provide valuable information to the diaspora on every sector relevant to their needs and interests, but will integrate the global Guyanese diaspora, connecting them to every ministry, agency, sub-agency, foreign mission, private sector, and others. The diaspora will also see more of the government as a rigorous global outreach program is planned for 2022. I now turn, sir, to our macroeconomic targets for 2022. Real gross domestic product. Mr. Speaker, real GDP is projected to grow by 47.5%, a rate of growth which no other country in the world is currently projected to achieve in 2022. This reflects the coming into operation of the second FPSO, the LISA Unity, which will, of course, significantly ramp up oil production. The non-oil economy is also expected to, con to continue registering very strong growth 
currently projected, sir, at 7.7% this year. Driven mainly by rebounds in rice and gold and continued expansion in construction activity and wholesale and retail trade. In agriculture, forestry and fishing, sir, the agriculture, forestry and fishing sector is, expect, is expected to expand by 8.9% this year, driven by growth across all sectors. The sugar growing subsector is projected to grow by 11.8% as Gaisuko will begin to recover from the onslaught of the 2021 floods with the aim of producing almost 65,000 tons of sugar. The rice growing sector subsector is forecasted to expand by 25.1% in 2022, a reversal of the 20.5% decline observed last year, largely on account of replanting efforts, as well as the introduction of, high, of new high-yielding varieties. Likewise, the other crop subsector is expected to recover in 2022 and grow by 2.5%. The livestock subsector will continue to expand with a rapid growth rate of 13.6% projected for 2022. Mr. Speaker, despite the challenges they face, forestry and fishing are also projected to grow by 13.5 and 5.8% respectively, reflecting, of course, a number of the initiatives to which I would have alluded earlier. Mr. Speaker, higher forestry output will meet partly the demand for timber products from public and private construction activity, which is also expected to grow very rapidly. In the extractive industry, the mining and quarrying sector is forecasted to grow by 86%. Underlying that, of course, is petroleum, the oil and gas sector, Petroleum is expected from both Liza Unity, Liza Destiny and Liza Unity FPSOs. And the rate of production for 2022 is expected to be approximately 257,000 barrels per day on average. As such, the sector is projected to grow by 96.7% in 2022. Additionally, a turnaround is anticipated for the gold mining subsector, which is projected to grow by 12.2% in 2022 on account of higher expected declarations of at least one operator, and also the small and medium scale of uh, miners. Mr. Speaker, the bauxite subsector, like many other productive sectors, faced tremendous interruptions in 2021. It is anticipated to recover in 2022, and is now projected to grow by 25.4%, with output expected from both large operators. Additionally, the other mining and quarrying subsector, which includes sand, stone, diamonds, that is also projected to grow in 2022, conservatively by 8.4%, driven mainly by the intensified public sector investment program and large private infrastructure projects expected to take off later this year. Manufacturing, sir, is expected to register an improved performance in all its subcategories. Sugar, rice, and other manufacturing are expected to expand by 11.8, 28.6, and 8.5% respectively. Growth in value added from sugar and rice manufacturing will reflect, of course, developments in cultivation and harvesting. And in the case of other manufacturing, we can expect further expansion in the manufacturing of non-metallic products like constru uh, construction blocks, chemical products, as well as manufacturing of fabricated metal products. In construction, our government is committed to filling the substantial infrastructure gap that exists across our country, as is reflected by the aggressive infrastructure agenda that I would have outlined earlier in this presentation. As a result, we project 10.5% growth in the construction sector, on top of the growth observed in the sector last year. 
Underlying that growth, of course, is also the very strong uh, construction boom taking place in the private sector. Mr. Speaker, in services, after facing significant challenges in 2020, many of the service industries began their recovery in 2021 on account of the phased, reop phased reopening of our economy and other measures put in place by this government to boost economic activity. In 2020, all of the service industries are projected to expand. Notably, significant increases are forecasted for wholesale and retail trade and repairs, transport and storage, financial and insurance activities, administrative and support services, and real estate activities, monetary policy and inflation. Mr. Speaker, in 2022, monetary policy will continue to be focused on price and exchange rate stability alongside growing the objective of growing credit to the private sector. This year, inflation is forecasted to be 4.1%, driven largely by continued but gradually moder moderating imported price pressure. Balance of payments. Mr. Speaker, the overall balance of payments is expected to register a surplus of $403.4 million, largely attributed to projected improvement in the current account. The current account is expected to record a surplus of $2,441.4 million, mainly on account of higher projected export earnings. Export receipts are forecasted to increase by 79.1% to 7 billion 792.8 million reflecting higher anticipated export earnings from all commodities in particular crude oil exports are projected to increase by 107.7% to 6 billion 180 million 180.6 million amidst the commencement of production from Lyser Unity Non-oil exports are forecasted to increase by 17.1% to 1.612 billion. At the same time, imports are expected to fall 31.1% to 2,957.1 million, as no FPSO is projected to be imported this year. The capital account is forecasted to record a deficit of $2 billion reflecting the operator's share of oil production applied to cost recovery, as well as a moderation of FDI flows, also as a result of no new FPSO being imported this year. Mr. Speaker, targets for the non-financial public sector, central government operations, Mr. Speaker, total central government revenue net of GRIF inflows and net of NRF withdrawal is projected to increase by 13.4% to $301.3 billion, within which tax collections will account for an estimated $286.8 billion, reflecting the strong continued investment and growth in the economy. Total expenditure of the central government is forecasted at $530 billion, 36.8% above 2021 expenditure. This is driven predominantly by the strong emphasis of budget 2022 on public investment. The PSIP is projected to grow by 108.7% to $217.8 billion. Meanwhile, sir, non-interest current expenditure is projected at $302.2 billion, 9.9% above the previous year. Mr. Speaker, as indicated earlier, Budget 2022 is the first budget ever to benefit from withdrawals from the Natural Resource Fund following the historic passage of the NRF Act last December. This Act, as I mentioned earlier today, address the most offensive deficiencies of the predecessor NRF Act. Pursuant to the provisions of the newly enhanced legal framework set out in the new NRF Act, Budget 2022 projects a withdrawal from the NRF and transfer to the Consolidated Fund of 126.7 billion Guyana dollars.
It would be noted, sir, that that corresponds with the closing balance on the fund as stipulated by Schedule 1 to the new NRF Act. Mr. Speaker, this ensures that the accelerated development agenda outlined in this budget, the critical investments proposed, as well as the measures still to be announced, can be financed without excessive borrowing and without the introduction of any new taxes. Mr. Speaker, against this background, the overall deficit of the central government is projected at 7% of GDP. Mr. Speaker, budget 2022 is 44.3% larger than budget 2021 and 36% above a total expenditure last year and amounts to $552.9 billion undoubtedly the largest budget ever and sir as indicated earlier it is fully financed with no new taxes turning to the public enterprises sir receipts from the non-financial public enterprises are expected to grow by 8.6 percent to reach 152.4 billion dollars their operating costs are projected to increase by 11.7 billion dollars primarily a gpl due to continued high anticipated oil prices mr speaker the regarding the operations of the non-financial public sector a deficit of $100.3 billion or 8% of GDP is projected for the non-financial public sector in 2022. Returning to, the natural, the, returning to the Natural Resource Fund, Mr. Speaker, having addressed the withdrawal from the Natural Resource Fund above, I will now address the projected inflows for 2022. With two FBSO vessels expected to be in operation this year, it is anticipated that there will be 94 lists it, it is anticipated that there will be 94 lifts from the Stabrook block, 13 of which will be government lifts. From this, it is estimated that deposits into the NRF for 2022 will total 957.6 million US dollars, comprising some 857.1 million dollars earned from the government lifts of profit oil and an additional 100.5 million dollars US dollars from royalties. Mr. Speaker, I now turn to budget measures. In addition to the wide range of public investment projects and initiatives announced earlier, all of which will stimulate economic activity, create jobs, and thereby generate incomes, Budget 2022 also proposes additional specific measures aimed at providing support to both households and businesses with the same objectives of job creation and income generation and ultimately improving well-being. Firstly, sir, we wish to announce a range of measures that address questions related to improving business competitiveness, promoting local content and job creation. Parity in tax treatment for local content. Mr. Speaker, when we were considering the Local Content Act, one of the recurring issues that arose was the question of ensuring that Guyanese businesses are not in a disadvantageous position relative to their international counterparts in competing for contracts with the oil and gas sector. This could arise, for example, where the oil and gas sector is procuring a service and the international companies are tendering to supply that service and they enjoy particular tax treatment on the importation of the capital, capital equipment to provide that service that the Guyanese companies might not enjoy, just to give an example. Mr. Speaker, in the interest of ensuring that Guyanese businesses can compete successfully under the new local content framework, our government will take steps wherever practicable to minimize disparities arising from the tax system. That will, disadvantage, that will cause disadvantage 
to Guyanese businesses against their international counterparts. This will help improve the competitiveness of Guyanese companies. It will help secure business opportunities for them, and it will thereby create jobs for Guyanese nationals. Secondly, supporting renew secondly still but still within the objective of improving business competitiveness and promoting local content and job creation supporting renewal of the industrial and commercial transport fleet mr speaker in this era of mass movement of goods and intensive logistics operations which are all critical to the oil and gas sector as well as the ongoing construction boom the transportation fleet has become an essential part of business capital stock. In this regard, we would like to enable Guyanese businesses to be able to renew and expand their transport fleets, and additionally to do so by acquiring newer, safer, and more efficient vehicles. To this end, we will be implementing the following measures. In relation to importation of new motor trucks of any tonnage for transport of goods, and I should add that new for the purposes for these for this purpose or for the purposes of this paragraph refers to vehicles less than four years old. In relation to importation of new motor trucks, that is to say trucks below four years old, of any tonnage for transport of goods we will remove the 10% excise tax as well as the 14% VAT that currently apply. Excellent. In relation to importation of new haulers for pulling containers or similar vehicles for pulling, we will remove the VAT of 14% that currently applies on those vehicles. In relation to importation of new double cab pickups below 2,000 cc, we will remove the currently applicable 10% excise tax altogether, while for new double cab pickups between 2,000 and 3,000 cc, we will reduce the excise tax from 110% to 75%. Wow. In relation to importation of new single cab pickups, Below 3,000 cc, we will remove the currently applicable 10% excise tax altogether. Still under the same category of improving competitiveness and promoting local content, reducing the cost of cranes, safety equipment, and oil spill equipment. Mr. Speaker, we will remove the 14% VAT on cranes, safety equipment, and oil response equipment, all as a part of ensuring that as many Guyanese companies as possible can equip themselves accordingly, given the requirements of the oil and gas sector today. Additionally, sir, it would be recalled that we had given a commitment to reverse the punitive taxes that were implemented by the APNU AFC once we return to office. One such tax that was implemented was a 2% withholding tax on resident contractors. This tax very severely affected the liquidity of resident contractors and therefore undermined their competitiveness. It also proved challenging to administer with very uneven compliance, particularly outside the central government. Mr. Speaker, I'm pleased to announce that we will remove this 2% withholding tax on resident contractors. This will immediately improve liquidity by those contract liqu the liquidity and liquidity management by those contractors. Mr. Speaker, together these measures will cost an estimated $2 billion and we will make, it, make, we will make, an, important dif and will make an important difference in ensuring the competitiveness of Guyanese businesses and therefore help to create jobs for the Guyanese people. I turn now, sir, to the third, to the second rather, broad category of measures. And here I address measures to ease 
the cost of living. First, sir, the introduction of farmers' markets. As already discussed, we recognize the fact that there's been some upward movement in prices at the marketplace for a number of food items. But, sir, we also observe that the extent of the upward price movement at the marketplace is not reflected in similar price movement at the farm gate. Indeed, market prices have increased much more steeply than farm gate prices. This, of course, reflects a number of factors, including transportation costs and multiple layers of handling and reselling from farm to final retail. But in the interest of reducing inefficiencies in this process, we will be arranging monthly farmers markets at locations to be specified in East Barbies, East Coast Demerara, Georgetown, East Bank Demerara, and West Coast Demerara in the first instance, with the possibility of extending to other locations depending on the initial experience. Mr. Speaker, this will help our farmers to find ready markets for their produce, and it will help consumers to benefit from the price advantage of buying directly from the farmer. Secondly, sir, under the same category, extending the freight cost adjustment. It would be recalled, sir, that His Excellency the President had announced in August 2021 an adjustment of the freight cost component in the CIF value used for calculating import taxes and in so doing rolled back freight taxes freight rolled back freight costs to pre-pandemic levels for the purposes of determining the cif value of items imported into guyana mr speaker this measure was initially due to expire on the 31st of january 2021 I'm pleased to announce now that we will be extending the application of this adjustment until the 31st of December 2022. Mr. Speaker, this measure alone is expected to cost in the order of $6 billion. Reducing the cost of fuel. Mr. Speaker, it is well known that this government established a mechanism whereby the excise tax on fuel is lowered when the world market price for fuel increases. As previously mentioned, we used this mechanism twice in 2021 to lower the excise tax rate on gasoline and diesel from 50 to 35 in the first instance and then from 35 to 20. Despite this, sir, the world market price continues to grow to increase and remain high. I'm therefore, sir, pleased to announce that utilizing the same well-established mechanism, our government will be lowering the excise tax rate, rate immediately on gasoline and diesel from 20% to 10%. Still on the subject of cost of living measure, sir, our government regards the issue of cost of living as a matter of pressing concern. As already discussed, it is the direct result of global factors such as COVID-19 and the attendant disruption to the supply chain, as well as domestic factors such as the flood which caused a temporary disruption to production. We have already implemented a number of measures to try to mitigate the effect of these shocks. Mr. Speaker, given the complexity of the factors driving price increases and the limited policy instruments available to mitigate these re in re increases, we intend to engage in further consultations with the communities most affected both on the coast and in the hinterland on possible interventions to help ease the impact on the most vulnerable in society. To this end, sir, and in order to meet the cost of the interventions to be implemented after we would have cons conducted these consultations, Budget 2022 allocates a sum of $5 billion to address this question of cost of living. 
supporting thirdly sir supporting the vulnerable mr speaker much has already been said about the public investments being made to improve the quality of the public health care system as well as to incentivize private investment in health care even as these investments are being advanced this country currently has a number of persons undergoing treatment for life threatening conditions a prime example is the number of persons currently receiving dialysis treatment many of whom are young people still in the prime of their lives but oftentimes struggling to meet the cost of their dialysis treatment to this to this, to this end sir or in response to this we will introduce a dialysis support program under which we will finance for each and every dialysis patient in Guyana dialysis treatment worth up to $600,000 per annum. Mr. Speaker, turning now to public assistance. Our government's public assistance program provides important income support for those in the most distressed of circumstances. This year, we will be increasing the monthly public assistance payment from 12,000 to 14,000, benefiting 18,000 persons and providing an immediate my apologies, and providing an additional $432 million in disposable income to these individuals. Support to the elderly. Mr. Speaker, we remain committed to ensuring that those who have served their country over the years and are now advanced in their years are able to enjoy a dignified existence. In this regard, it will be recalled that we increased the old age pension last year in 2021 from 20,500 to 25,000. Mr. Speaker, this year we will be increasing the old age pension further from 25,000 to 28,000. This will place an additional $2.3 billion of disposable income in the hands of our 65,000 old age pensioners. Fourthly, sir, but somewhat on the related subject of increasing disposable income, uniform grants for school children. Recognizing that there is no greater investment that can be made than investing in our young people, our government has historically placed the highest importance on supporting parents in ensuring that their children can attend school. One such measure that we introduced is the annual uniform grant given to parents of each school child. I'm pleased to announce that we will increase that grant this year from $4,000 to $5,000 per child. And this will place in the hands, in the homes of those children, 200, an additional $200 million of disposable income. Relatedly and in addition, sir, turning to the Because We Care cash grants, it would be recalled that we had also introduced a Because We Care cash grant, a cash grant that is called, described as Because We Care, a grant in addition to the uniform allowance, the uniform grant, on top of that, a grant to parents of children attending school to meet other expenses associated with their children's attendance at school. And it would be recalled, sir, that this grant was unconscionably, as I mentioned earlier, discontinued by the APNU AFC when they assumed office in 2015, taking that grant away from the parents of the, every single child going to school in Guyana. I'm told that the removal of the, that grant was to finance increased dietary expenditure. Mr. Speaker, we committed, while in opposition, we committed that immediately on returning to office, we will restore that grant, and we did so. Another promise delivered. We also said we will increase that grant. 
And we did so, increasing it, sir, to 15,000 in budget 2021. Mr. Speaker, I am now pleased to announce that we will increase that grant further from 15,000 per child to 25,000 per child. Mr. Speaker, this will place in the homes of those 200,000 children going to school in public, and I hasten to add now for the avoidance of doubt and in private school, this will place in the hands of those parents a total of $2 billion. Still on the subject of increasing disposable income, sir, we would like, sir, to incentivize saving in the banking system, encouraging persons as they get jobs, and I've outlined earlier all of the government, many of the government programs that create an opportunity for persons to get jobs, the thousands of jobs that will be created as persons get increasing numbers of persons get jobs, including young professionals. They start to earn an income and they start to accumulate some savings. And as those who are already in jobs advance themselves professionally and increase their incomes and improve their circumstances, we want, sir, to incentivize at the household level, to encourage and incentivize saving accumulation of saving at the household level. It would be recalled in that regard, sir, that a withholding tax is currently charged on interest income earned on deposits in the banking system. In order to alleviate the impact of this withholding tax on individuals with modest deposits, individuals, not businesses or companies, in order to alleviate the impact of this withholding tax on individuals with modest deposits and to encourage them to, save, to go to the banking system and to save, we are proposing to remove the withholding tax from individuals whose total interest income does not exceed $10,000 per annum. Reducing the cost of life and medical insurance Similarly, sir, on the same note, as more of our Guyanese brothers and sisters enter the world of work, and as more of our Guyanese brothers and sisters start earning an income and start earning an, in an increased income, and as their disposable income start to rise, they become better able to make provision for unforeseen or adverse circumstances. Some of the typical instruments that households would, would use for that purpose would include, of course, insurance. Taking out an insurance policy to ensure that if you are the sole breadwinner and a calamity were to befall you, that your surviving relatives would not be left in poverty and penury. Taking out medical insurance policy, taking out medical insurance so that in the event you face a catastrophic medical condition, that you will not find yourselves out of pocket and completely bankrupt and unable to finance the cost of your medical treatment. As more and more Guyanese families get jobs, increase their incomes, find themselves in a circumstance where they can deploy this tool of insurance, life insurance and medical insurance to manage risk within their own home and ensure that their relatives are not left in poverty or that they are not left in poverty in the event of their demise or in the event of a calamitous medical situation, they take out insurance. We want to make taking out that insurance cheaper, more affordable, sir. We would like to encourage as many of them to take out insurance because it, help, it enables individuals and their loved, one, loved ones to be better able to cope with these adverse circumstances whenever, sadly and tragically, they occur. To this end, we are proposing to allow taxpayers a deduction from their chargeable income 
for premiums paid for life and medical insurance up to a maximum of 10% of their income or $30,000 monthly, whichever is lower. This deduction, sir, will reduce the amount of taxable income and ultimately the tax payable by the taxpayer, while at the same time secure assurance and set to rest the concerns of many citizens on their long-term health care needs and the needs of their family in the unfortunate circumstances that I outlined. Personal income tax. Mr. Speaker, along with all of the other measures proposed to increase disposable income, our government would also like to provide additional relief to taxpayers. In this regard, we are proposing to increase the monthly income tax threshold from $65,000 to $75,000 monthly. This releases immediately, sir, into the hands of current taxpayers a total of $1.3 billion of additional disposable income. If I might add, sir, a final category of measures. The first is in relation to the low-income mortgage ceiling. I've already spoken, sir, about the impact that reintroducing and reinvigorating this low-income mortgage program has had both on access to finance and the cost of finance and the level of credit for the purposes of home ownership in the banking system. It would be recalled that when we assumed office, or since we assumed office rather, we announced two increases in the ceiling on low-income loans. The first was done, sir, in the emergency budget of 2020, when we increased the ceiling from $8 million to $10 million. And the second was done in budget 2021, when we increased the ceiling from $10 million to $12 million. I wish, sir, to announce a further increase in the ceiling from $12 million to $15 million. This will make housing loans from commercial banks more affordable to borrowers within that range and will help to encourage the thousands of persons who will be getting a house lot over the course of the coming year or who have already obtained a house lot since we resumed our government housing program to be able to go to the bank and obtain financing. So, next, sir still under the, what I would describe as other measures, stamp duty on retail transactions. Mr. Speaker, it has been a long-standing irritant to the business community and the consuming public, the requirement to affix revenue stamps on receipts issued for retail transactions. And compliance levels are very uneven. We are proposing, sir, to abolish this requirement specifically as it relates to retail transactions only. Remigrants. Mr. Speaker, I've already spoken of how much this government values the potential contribution of the diaspora and that given the opportunities that now exist in Guyana, the increased likelihood of remigration by overseas-based Guyanese. In this regard, Yet another one of the punitive tax changes made by our predecessors in office was to alter the entitlements of our remigrating diaspora, particularly in relation to importation of a vehicle when they return. In this regard, we propose to revert to the more flexible arrangement that existed prior to 2015. Mr. Speaker, Together, though it is estimated conservatively that those measures will place more than $25 billion in the hands of Guyanese businesses and individuals. But at the same time, sir, it will help to ease considerable hardship in the case of those measures that address hardship. And it will, these measures will also simultaneously, sir, help to stimulate 
thousands of jobs, particularly those that relate to improving competitiveness and promoting competitiveness of Guyanese businesses within the local content framework. And it is, sir, on that note that I come to, con to my conclusion. Mr. Speaker, although this is not, this is the third, not the first or the second budget of this People's Progressive Party civic government since we, assumed, since we resumed office. Budget 2022 is indeed an historic budget. It sets us resolutely on the path to realizing the bright future we have long awaited. It launches some of the most transformative projects in our country's history. Projects whose realization will be critical to resolving the bugbears and bottlenecks that we have long faced, whether it be adequate and affordable electricity, a transport network that is responsive to both productive opportunities and changing patterns of urbanization, whether it be improved medical services for our people, whether it be providing opportunities for young people to obtain training that is relevant to the job market, whether it is an investment in promoting the arts and the culture, it would be recalled that an announcement was made earlier regarding an allocation of $100 million to promote to establish the National Endowment Fund for the Arts and promote the arts and the culture, whether it be investment in, um, in strengthening the institutions of state, like the judiciary, whether it be strengthening the security sector to ensure that our citizens are safer. In every respect, sir, if one were to peruse every sector within budget 2022 one will see that this budget heralds a dramatic change in course for us change in trajectory for us because this is the budget in i suppose so that it could be said that in some respects notwithstanding that budget 2020 was of course an emergency budget and budget 2021 was the budget in which we outlined our medium-term plans. I believe it would be fair to say, sir, that budget 2022 can well be regarded as the budget that truly launched the transformation of Guyana, the building of the modern Guyana. And I rather suspect, sir, that when the history of our country is written, shall have been written, the history of our country during this period shall have been written, that future generations will consider that 2022 was the year in which Guyana's great transformation began. Whether it be the gas to shore, or Amila, or the modern new hospitals that are being built, highways and bridges, power plants, I rather suspect, sir, that 2022 shall be remembered as the year in which this great transformation began. I suppose I would say, sir, I would put it differently, that if this era is a special era in Guyana's history, and I believe we all agree that this era is a special era in Guyana's history, then 2022 must be a special year within that era. Mr. Speaker, indeed, sir, I consider it a singular privilege to have been able to present this historic budget on behalf of this People's Progressive Party government. <laughs> Mr. Speaker, my fervent, I wouldn't want to leave the podium without the following observation. My fervent hope is that this budget is judged on its merits, what it is doing for the people of Guyana. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have no doubt that it will, it will be judged in that manner by the people of Guyana, but my fervent hope is that it is judged in this house, particularly by our colleagues on that side of the house. And I trust that they see this budget on its merits, because I do believe, sir, that given its historic and transformative nature, budget 2022 deserves 
the unanimous approbation of this honorable house. I will conclude I will conclude by acknowledging the very hard work done by my cabinet colleagues under, of course, the leadership of His Excellency the President. A lot of tremendous amount of work was done in all of the sectors. And of course, the dozens of civil servants who contributed to the compilation of this budget, especially that they did this while working with a very severely constrained environment given, given that COVID-19 is still with us. And of course, sir, as I always do, I save the last word for my own team at the Ministry of Finance, if you'll permit me that small prejudice, sir. I save the last word for my own team at the Ministry of Finance, without whose tremendous work preparation of this historic budget would not have been possible, and whose contribution will be equally invaluable in the execution of this historic budget in the months and years ahead. Mr. Speaker, as I said a few minutes ago, on behalf of this People's Progressive Party civic government, the honor is mine to commend to this House Budget 2022. Thank you very much. Sir. Thank you, Honorable Speaker.